Okay, we did something completely new to finish out season three. We did a two-parter. This is originally our top story from episode 97. Leanne and I went into a few hours on that discussion, so we decided to split it up into a few pieces to spare the bobs out there. So we now present you episode 99, taken from episode 97, in two parts. This is part one. to our top story. News team, assemble! Let's get down, let's get down to business. And I got news for you. Leon, this one comes to us from the Pew Research Center. Pew, pew! (laughs) Pew! I like to pull various surveys throughout the year because I think it sparks conversation and it gets us wondering about what does the data say? And in this case, I have a whole year in review. You, Leon. Exciting stuff. Okay. I'm excited. All right. A record high share of 40 year olds in the United States have never been married. Mm -hmm. Okay. They figured it out. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I'll go with that. That works. Let's think social media for that. Yeah, that, that tracks. The word got out. In 2021, the demographic groups most likely not to have ever been married by age 40 include men, black Americans, and those without a four-year college degree. Was that Interesting. Was that tell you? The idiocracy was spot on. That's right. Mm-hmm. If you want to look smart, get married. <laughs> or wear glasses. Or wear glasses. Got it. <laughs> One or the other. While majorities say that having a job or career they enjoy and having close friends are extremely or very important for living a fulfilling life, far fewer say this about having children or being married. Larger shares, in fact, say having children or being married are not too or not at all important. Hmm. Such are the times we live in. Number two, about half of Americans say the increased use of artificial intelligence in daily life makes them feel more concerned than excited, up 14 percentage points from last year. Overall, Mm -hmm. 52% of Americans say they feel this way, an increase from 38% in December. Just 10% of adults say they are more excited than concerned about the increased use of AI, while 36% they say they feel an equal mix of these emotions. What do you you feel? What what does Leon feel? I'm the equal mix. I'm the equal mix. I do think that we're going to build Terminators that will kill us. Mm -hmm. But I also feel like, as I've said many times on the show, we haven't cured cancer. Mm -hmm. So let's give AI a shot. That's right. That and there's there's things that need to be fixed, and it's more complex than we have the ability to fix. So I'm looking forward to to using it for the right reasons. But I do think did have you seen one of the most recent South Parks? Because I thought it was hilarious. <laughs> but it's actually as they always do. They just nail it, right? They just they take they, do. they take the most absurd take, and their take on AI was a scene where Stan's father, who's a geologist, and Kyle's father, who's an, uh, a lawyer and accountant, and a bunch of the other dads that were what I would, what I would say are college degree type professions. And they're all holding out, they're all outside Home Depot with signs looking for work because AI replaced them. And I thought that's hilarious but also, ironically, there's some truth there I think there's because I think the there. trades are going to have to take over that you're going. If you think that this movement of working from home and working on a computer, if your job is working on a computer, you might want to rethink what you're doing because you might get replaced by AI in the next 10 years. So that's that's a scary thought. I'll do one better. Uh, And I believe this 100%. The people that can leverage AI are going to steal jobs from the people who can't. Yeah. So if you're on the fence as to whether or not ChatGPT or Claude or Bard or Grok is for you, get on it. Because unless you're completely secure in what value you provide, 
somebody's going to come along that can leverage AI and they're going to run circles around. That's exactly right. So I, I use, would consider I use myself them. one of the 10% because I am very excited about it. Yeah. But you don't believe in the Terminator. Uh, so or the I, Matrix. Believe, I believe that the hardware is what determines the threat. Mm. I don't believe that lines of computer code are what are going to end us. What's going to happen is some idiot is going to put computer code into a missile or some idiot is going to put computer code into a robot. And so those are the people that are going to end civilization. And I don't think you can blame AI for that any more than you can blame a shovel for being a weapon of murder or digging a hole. Oh, I don't blame AI. I just so, believe that it makes us closer to total yes, annihilation. I, I think it is. Yes, it'll, it'll put us closer to annihilation. But it's the idiot that puts it into a chrome skeleton and gives it Arnold's voice. That's the one that ended civilization, not the AI. Yeah. So whoever gave the kids at the gas station matches, that's who's <laughs> going to ruin civilization. But you're the one who buys their beer. Got it. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> like, what yes. age do you say no to? Like, if they look like, are you, are you really going to, if they hand you 20, like, hey, man, hey, man. <laughs> I have, not been, I have not been propositioned yet. I think I'm probably going to get out more. Either have I. The way we used to do it, the way we used to roll up behind somebody buying a case of beer, and we used mm-hmm. to say, hey, man, that's a nice <laughs> case of beer. And they'd say, thanks. <laughs> and we'd say, you should get another one of those. And they said, oh, really? Let's pay for that one. Yeah, big party. Really? Big party. Probably get two cases of beer. Yeah, we think you should get one more. <laughs> okay. Well, we're already here. Why don't you guys go get it? And so then we'd go and we'd get the case of beer and we'd come back and we'd go, this is for you. And we'd look at the girl behind the counter and we'd go, this is his beer. <laughs> and then he'd pay for it. We'd meet him on the parking lot. We'd pay him back. We'd take our beer and we'd go. That was the classy way. Yeah. Nowadays, now they, they just, just get it delivered from Uber. Yeah. Now they take Drizzly or Uber Eats or whatever. Or they just Blazing. run in the store with a hood on and steal it. It's like going to buy porn. Like you used to have to be embarrassed. Like you'd have to go through the shame of going in the there aisle used to behind be the shame. Curtain. You you'd kids. have to go through the aisle in the curtain. You had to. You're like, I hope no one recognizes me as I go into this section. But now you're like, you get like one million percent nastier stuff on your phone while you're taking a poop. We used to have to enjoy ourselves with a gigantic squiggly line going to the middle of the screen. You kids nowadays. Scrambled. <laughs> Was that a nipple? I don't know. Male or female. Who knows? You kids and your digital. (laughs) All right, here we go. Number three. For the first time in over 30 years of public opinion polling, Americans' views of the U.S. Supreme Court are more negative than positive. Their majority, 54%, have an unfavorable view of the high court, while fewer than half express a favorable one. You can see here that it looks like the time that they were the most favorable with the court was sometime in the mid-90s, 94, 95. Yeah, I can't remember. There was a big, big decision that came in '95 when we were kids, but it seems to have gone way downhill since then. That's politically charged now. Yep, and that's that's never been more evident than it has been less. And the reason I think the reason they say in, in 30 years of opinion polling, I'm sure if you go back to like the 1880s, it was like, oh, that Supreme Court sucks. There used to be integrity. Like there used to be people that would interpret the law in a way that it was supposed to be interpreted, and it has taken a very hard turn to finding a narrative that supports your party's interests and interpreting it that way. And I don't know what, and that definitely has happened more so in the last definite, I would say 10 years more Uh, than anything. 10, 10, 15 years, at least according to the data, you can see a very distinct difference in the opinion. There's a little bit of a blip there and, what, 06, 07, but that was the financial crisis. But other than that, it's been going steadily down. And I think it peaked somewhere around, let's see, 13, 14, 15 or 16. So, and then it got a big bump during the Donald and then. Well, I'm, I'm on the lower side. I've been very upset with it. But I mean, a Supreme Court across the board. Talking States about AI, the top. pretty soon AI is going to replace them. Judges should be robots. So what does the law say? How do you interpret the law? Yeah. That way, that way you don't have to worry about political affiliations and what your spouse is exactly. doing. And, and this who is precedent. Right. This is what it is. This It is or it isn't. That's it. Boom. Done. That's what it should be. Number four. Growing share of U.S. adults say the federal government should take steps to restrict false information online, even if it limits freedom of information. 
The old freedom versus security argument. Wait, what was the what was the number you got here? So let's see here. In the most recent survey, 42% of adults took the opposite view, saying the government should protect freedom of information, even if it means false information can be published. So the share of U.S. adults with this view has risen from 39 to 55%. So more than half think that the government should do something about restricting false information online. Or sh- shit. So misinformation. Who, I don't believe fake this. Fake news. I don't believe this. And I don't believe it. It looks like... The U.S. government, over half believe the U.S. government should do something about it. And Get 65% out of here. think tech companies should do something about it. Should Stop take steps it. to restrict false information online, even if it limits freedom of information. And then yeah, notice responders that did not answer are not shown. Yeah, there's, there's a lot yeah, going I mean, on here. That's data. Wait, where do you stand? Do you want the um, government to tell you? I don't want what's, anybody. Right, restricting what's wrong? It. I don't want anybody restricting it all. Yeah, I think that is the general consensus of I, literally I, everybody I like on both sides of the aisle I've ever talked to. Once you prove it, but yeah. I don't want to restrict it. No, I mean I think uh, I think the Here's laws how you get somebody are, to stop doing it. You put them in handcuffs and you walk them in front of the courthouse to the cameras. That's how you get it to stop. Until then, well, you're not going to put some filter or algorithm in place that's going to make people be truthful. Well, laws already exist where you can't. Um, knowingly lie you can't about anyone or anything you can't use defamation you can't these already exist so why take the extra step and say you need some somebody to filter it for you and tell you whether or not it's true or not when everything is through a prism and every every bit of information is always going to be and and that we've learned that in the last three years more than anything You know, more than anything, what we've learned on what happened with Twitter and what's happened with Facebook and how information was throttled or not throttled. And if that doesn't frighten you and that doesn't affect that number, who the hell is paying attention to this? I that's that's mind blowing to me. Still, Americans. I think that's the scariest shit I've ever seen. It is scary. Uh, Still, Americans remain more likely to say the tech companies, rather than the U.S. government, should be responsible for restricting false information online. About two thirds. Unbelievable! I don't buy it. Where's this coming from? Two out of every three people. Two out of every three people surveyed by Pew in June of 2023 think that tech companies need to do a better job of restricting false information. Okay. All right. I, I'm I'm with you on this one, Leon. I think better enforcement is you're just going to keep doing more laws to cover up for lax enforcement. So have somebody do a perp walk. You catch them, they knowingly put out false information, just slap the cuffs on them, and you parade them in front of the cameras. That'll get people to stop doing it real quick. Yeah. Number five, the number of U.S. children and teens killed by gunfire rose 50% in just two years, according to a 2023 analysis of data from the Centers for Disease Control. In 2019, there were 1,700 gun deaths among U.S. children and teens. By 2021, that figure had increased to 2,590. The gun death rate among children and teens, a measure that adjusts for changes in the nation's population, was 46%. So we can see here, uh, the study goes back to 99. So from 99 to 13, gun deaths were going down. Mm -hmm. And then from 13 to 17, we got a pop. From 17 to 19, it was relatively flat. And then from 19 to 21, it was a 50% increase. And this is U.S. specifically, right? Uh, Yep. It seems like it is, yeah. In the United States. Includes homicides, suicides, accidents, and all the categories of gun deaths. So it's not murder per se. It's just gun deaths. So this could be kids playing around with a gun. This could be school shootings. This could be accidents. So, So when you look at it, though... And you're going from 1,732 in 2019 to this one seems to end on 21, right? Yeah. So that 2,590. Okay. So you got about 600, let's call it 900 more people, um, which 900 isn't a, a number to blink at, but in the grand scheme of everything, I I, I feel like... This is one of those charts that if you set the scale just right, it looks loud. You know, have you ever done that when you're trying to explain the point? This is one of the ways that, because I know you understand this, Mr. I never use a mouse Excel. The one of the ways that you tell a really good story is how you represent the data. So for those of you listening at home that follow the link to this study, I want you to take a look at the floor. The floor is 1258. Yeah. So within this time span, 
in 2013, we had a floor of 1258. So wipe that, make that the new zero, then go back in and calculate. And what you find is the peak of the data in 2021 across what appears to be a 22 or 23 year span from peak to peak to trough, we doubled. So whatever was going on in 2013, we've doubled since then. Mm -hmm. That is an astounding statistic. But then you get to Leon's point, in terms of numbers, how many children are there under 18 in the United States? And what percentage is that at 2590? Could be 0.001%. So do you, again, do you, there's, a, there's a danger in percentages. And, and you know I love playing the devil's advocate. And since we don't have the other two guys here, I'm just going to throw out every alternate point that I can think of. And one counterpoint to this, and there is no way to collect the data that I've ever known. But if you talk to people that are big gun advocates, um, I'm kind of in the middle. Like, I feel like the regulation needs to exist, but I also don't feel like they should infringe too much. Uh, just, just to be honest, but I feel like the missing element or story, whenever you look at these gun deaths are, but how many, how many deaths were prevented? And how many crimes were prevented because people were armed and, and that number is never represented because it doesn't exist because people don't collect it, but you see it online all the time, right? You see somebody, a woman where she's about to get robbed. She pulls a gun out and the person runs away or there's a store clerk and he pulls the gun out and the person runs away. And, um, and you see it all the time. I just feel like this is also a representation of the amount of S escalation aggression and um and what's the other word i'm looking for uh, the, not des yeah it's 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 desperation but like people are in in a state where they will take things farther than they usually do because they need something more than they ever have and and, and i as you start to go barreling towards these if, if you don't believe we're headed towards a recession, you're crazy right now. Every indicator says we are absolutely headfirst into a recession right now. So people I'm seeing are getting more and more desperate. And so there's more altercations. And so, okay, let's pull up the knife stabbings. Let's pull up the fights, fist fights. Oh, all you of think them they're, all gonna, they're all up. They're all up. I think aggression is up. And so, if you're against guns, then yes, yeah, this is a great chart for you. Um, and I'm against guns to a certain point. I don't think that crazy people should have guns. Like I, we've talked about this in the past. I don't know on the show or not, but uh, I'm not going to get super political about, yes, the second amendment is a thing and you have to deal with whatever that, whatever that means. But everyone always looks at the bad side of it but how often are we ever looking and the answer is never i've never seen charts on it on how many times did guns prevent somebody from getting hurt or killed prevent it you don't know you don't have that number because it's not a very good looking number let me throw another one at you mm -hmm. so take take yours into account is guns that encounter guns that's a good one the other one i'll throw at you is what they don't include here is distance from the trauma center yeah that's so a good one for example what I can tell you is that in the New York tri-state area, you're never more than five miles from a trauma center. Chicago, yeah. Whereas Chicago, yeah. you're more likely an hour from a trauma center because there are no trauma centers in the South Side. And right. So the area that's like the murder capital of the world where everybody dies from gun deaths is typically because by the time they get somebody to a hospital, they can't save them. So what yeah, I'm curious to know point. is, could you throw in that correlated data here? You know, are there gun deaths out in rural areas where they don't have access to somebody that knows how to repair them? So what you'd want to dig into with something like this is, one, how often are these gun deaths caused by interactions with somebody else who was armed? And how often do these gun deaths happen in areas where they're too far away from a trauma center to be able to prevent? Mm -hmm. Fun I think, with you know, what's, in, what's interesting is everybody, I think, is on the same page. People don't want innocent people to die. Yeah, I think that's right. no matter the weapon, no matter the means. And I know that it's like, well, guns are more rapid than knives. Yeah, they are. And they're more and knives are more rapid than fists. Yeah, they are. Um, and, you know, I think the days of having fisticuffs 
<laughs> when you're when you're getting challenged on the schoolyard seem to be going away these days. So you have to be very well, careful. It would be nice to do the more guns cause more gun deaths argument. But I would argue from 2008 to 2013, the number of guns rose at a very alarming rate. So there's no correlation with gun ownership and gun deaths, at least from 08 there, to 13. There, there isn't. They've tried so hard yeah. to correlate that. It's, and it I'm isn't more, because you look at the Texas and, the, you know, well, yeah, everyone's more, armed. More so guns don't. is going to equal more gun deaths on the aggregate, but you can't find an immediate correlation no. uh, from gun purchases. But anyway, fun with data. Yeah. Number six, most Asian Americans view their ancestral homelands favorably, but not the Chinese. Interesting. So we have Vietnamese friends, Philippine friends. Uh, I'm sure we know some South Koreans. I have some Japanese. I have some Taiwan. You got any Indian friends there? I do. Of all of these surveyed, all of them look upon the motherland favorably, except for the Chinese. And we're not talking Taiwan and we're not talking Hong Kong. We're not talking Singapore. We're talking mainland China. And pretty mm -hmm. much what the data says is anybody from mainland Chinese descent they look back at the homeland and say, fuck them. Yeah. Only about four in 10 Chinese Americans have a favorable opinion of China, while 35% have an unfavorable one. Another 22%, they have a neither favorable nor unfavorable view. This stands in contrast to how other Asian Americans view their ancestral homelands. For instance, nine in 10 Taiwanese and Japanese love where they're from, as do large majorities of Korean, Indian, and Filipino. While Chinese Americans' views of China are more mixed, they still have a more favorable opinion of the country than other Asian adults do. Just 14% of other Asian Americans view China favorably. So Chinese don't like China and everybody else doesn't like China, according to Pew. Okay, Pew. As we I are not it. Asian, we probably can't comment too much on this, but... Okay. Hard for me to... Yeah. Number eight. Majority of Americans say they would tip 15% or less for an average restaurant dining experience, including 2% who wouldn't leave a tip at all. This has been a very popular topic on the Bottle of Brown podcast. Mm -hmm. The survey presented respondents with a hypothetical scenario in which they want to a sit-down restaurant and had average but not exceptional food and service. About 6 in 10 say they would leave a tip of 15% or less in this situation. Another 12% say they would leave a tip of 18%, and a quarter of people said they'd tip 20% or more. Adults in lower-income households and those aged 65 or older more likely than their counterparts to say they would tip 15% or less. So basically, if you're older or have less money, you don't tip, like Mr. Pitt. Mm -hmm. Standard tip when dining at a sit-down restaurant is 15% or less. Majority of adults would do 15, but you're kind of split between less than 15 and 20. And then you've got that 2% who would do that. You know what I would like to see is a restaurant chain called no tipping and see how they do i don't think they do well okay maybe not we talked about this i mean they pop up in weird spots there was one that popped up in new york that made the headlines there was one that popped up in newport beach they just they don't i i think that people well lately with inflation doing shit to every single menu across the country it's hard to tell but i think the idea was people kind of balked at the at the higher price menu and it's like well yeah it's higher price so you don't have to tip but then they start thinking to themselves maybe they're doing the math and they're thinking these prices are more than 20% over that restaurant over there. So I don't know, but it's not, you would think that based on what everybody thinks, you would start seeing places that say tipping is not allowed. We pay our employees, but I don't think yeah, people, people are stupid. I got it. People, people will not do the actual math. They'll just see it on the menu and go, this is, this burger is $18 instead of $15. So I don't want any part of it. This is bullshit. Yeah. Got it. Number 10. Nearly half of U.S. workers who get paid time off don't take it. Among those who say their employer offers paid time off for vacation, doctor's appointments, or to deal with minor illnesses, 46% say they take less time off than they are allowed. A similar share say they typically take all the time off they're offered. So half and half. Among those who don't take all their paid time off, the most common reasons cited are not feeling the need to take more time off, worrying they might fall behind, or feeling badly about their coworkers taking up the slack. Now, I was always you are the hoarding. boss of bosses right now, but I'm very curious about your previous life. Well, I will tell you right now that the, one of the first things I did when I took over was I initiated unlimited time off. Smart man. So, um, and the reason I did that is because 
I used to hoard time off because you don't know what's coming up in the future and you don't know if you're going to need it. So if you have, if you come to a point where you're like, do I go to Disneyland with my daughter today or in two weeks, or maybe I get COVID at the end of the year, uh, I'm going to have to, I'm going to do the responsible choice and say, I'm not going to go to Disneyland with my daughter because I don't know what I'm going to get at the end of the year. Am I going to need it? And I've only got three days left. So I think that's why a lot of people don't use all their time. At least that's the reason I didn't. And a lot of my friends, because you, you got to that point. And then also a lot of companies have this policy, like at the end of the year, like you don't use it, you don't, you lose it or, um, you can't burn all your vacation in some December. States do that. Yeah. Some States do that. Yeah. So you're, what are you going to do? You know, they, it's a horrible scenario. Well, good thing for the company I used to work for is that your year started and ended on your hire date, which is brilliant. So that everybody didn't just expire in December, you know, like everybody had their own year. So when you were coming up to that month where you had to burn it, you you could burn it, which I thought was a, a good idea. And I, I recommend anyone who continues to have that type of policy, spread it across the board so that people can actually burn it and it doesn't all end up on the same month. So I got two things on this one. One, as awful as your state has become, PTO hours roll over. Yeah, that's nice. So you never lose. Two, and Mr. Jones will be backing up on this because I think we've brought this up in the pod before. PTO is essentially a liability on the books. Yeah. So the idea is if you accrue this time, whether or not you spend it, it's like money that could be spent. So for those of you bobs out there that are worried about what your credit score is and you're looking at your credit report, when they talk about credit utility, that's what they're talking about is can you go out tomorrow and buy everything. And that's what they're worried about is if you have a fifty or sixty thousand dollar credit limit across all of your credit cards, you could effectively go out tomorrow and spend fifty eight thousand dollars on credit. And now they're responsible for managing you paying it back. That's what I mean by a liability of the books. So if somebody's got sixty hours of PTO, that's what? Six, seven days, right? Yeah. No. On the books, that's 60 hours times whatever your hourly rate is. Even for those of you Bobs out there that are salary, you have an hourly rate. You may not think you do, but you do. So think about what your PTO hours are and think about what your hourly rate is and combine that. And think about what your liability on the books is come December 31st. It's the number of PTO hours you have accrued times your hourly wage. The company has to keep that on the books as a liability. So if revenue goes down, too bad. That number sticks. And they don't use it. There's nothing they can do about it. It's like a gift card. You're on the hook for it. So a buddy of mine who is uh, working at a public company right now who are kind of at the bottom of a cycle, they're not doing so well. So they got an email from HR that said, guess what? Business is slow. You need to burn PTO the week after vacation. And so for the four days after Christmas, they'll pay you holiday pay for the 25th, but they'll ask you very strenuously and they can make you liquidate 32 hours of PTO for that week. And it's all about the taxable year. Yeah. So you saying no more PTO from an accounting perspective, fucking brilliant. Where I think you might run into trouble is if you have really, really diligent workers, they're going to fall into this 46% who are worried if I leave, the job might not be here when I come back. See above Elon. Two, I am putting an undue burden on the people I leave behind. Because when I leave, they're going to have to pick up the slack. And I don't want them hating me when I come back, which is dumb. Because if you ever see somebody that says, I'm, t and you, I'm going to quote Leon on this one. If you say I'm taking vacation, good for you. Well done. If you take a sick day, fuck you. You're a piece of shit. Yeah. And then the third thing is I might fall behind at work because I can't maintain my workload. Luckily in my world, uh, options B and C didn't, of what you just said didn't apply, which would, which would made the unlimited policy spot on for us. Because what happens is the assistant managers just get more money. I just pay them. <laughs> so it's, it's a win 
for them. They're happy that you went on vacation. Everyone's happy and nothing really gets dropped. There's not work that piles up. So what I was running into though, is what you exactly were saying is that people just wouldn't leave. They just wouldn't take a break. And I don't think that's healthy on any level. So I, I think the, I think the investment in paying your assistant managers to, to cover is, is paid back in triplicate when it comes to just uh, mental health when the people come back. So I'm a big advocate for taking time off. I, I think that uh, I've spent enough time and as have you, Danny, uh, traveling the world and, and you and you've worked with many other cultures. And if you really talk to other cultures, you'd spend real time like people go, oh, Americans are lazy. We're fat and lazy. But if you talk to other cultures for real about Americans, we never fucking stop. And it's annoying to them. It's annoying. Even on our days off, we don't get over answering. That. We're answering emails on our, when we're out the bar, we're answering emails and, and we, we get like a fraction of the vacation that any other country gets. We're workaholics. And so whatever stigma that we gave ourselves to say, Americans are fat, lazy, we don't do, nobody believes that but us because we don't stop working. We're actually annoying. We're that weird new employee that just started in the company that's making everybody look bad because they're they're knocking it out of the park. That's what America is. I love the no PTO because it really comes down to a relationship between you and your manager. You mm-hmm. remove a lot of regulation from it. You remove a lot of red tape and bureaucracy and bullshit. And it comes down to, hey, boss, I'm not coming in today. Are you okay with that? And then it's the boss's job to say, are you productive enough to justify your existence here? Yes, take all the time you want. Now, the critics approach to no PTOs, well, you can take off as much as you want. Yeah, you can. Because if you produce, who cares? I'm reading a couple of articles now trying to understand this psychologically. And I'm thinking about making it maybe one of the segments for the podcast is there's kids out there now that are taking two or three jobs remote. At the same time. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking to myself, yeah, good for you. Now, obviously, if you get caught, you get fired. That's part of the territory. But it clearly shows that the company is getting enough value from you that they're not going to fire you. Yet, you're clearly not giving them dedicated 40 hours because there isn't 120 hours in a week that you can dedicate. They're all expecting 8 to 5 out of you Monday to Friday. You can't physically do that three times and pull three times the salary. So it goes back to what I was saying in some of the earliest episodes of the pod is being there. And I know you don't agree with this, Liam, which is, I'm going to respect you on this. Being there is not a proxy for productivity. But if you get the work done, it shouldn't matter where you do the work from. I'm not, I just threw a lot at you. I want you you to take a breath because I threw a lot at you there. No, no, no. I I know why you said that. And I would, I'm only speaking from my current world, not my previous world. So I'll go from my current world. Uh, If you are a good leader or a good management company or whatever you're doing, and you have a really good uh, set of goals, targets, uh, KPIs, whatever you need to do to say that this is, this is the measure of success. And this is the target. These are, this is budget. This is approval. This is all these different things. You put all that together and you say, this is our baseline. This is good. This is great. You have to be above the baseline. Take all the vacation you want. I don't care if you take 300 days off a year. If we're above that baseline, you're knocking it out of the park. You're doing a great job because that's all that matters to me. That's all that should matter to me. I'm a businessman. So uh, it's when when you take it to a different level and you feel like that, uh, but I will say that one of those KPIs is budget, right? So if part of your budget is going towards paying an assistant manager to do what you should be doing, but you're really light on everything else and it doesn't matter, right? You're hitting your budget. That's, that's one of those things. It's, it is a variable. So there are, it, they're understanding it as much as I do. And we're all on the same page. We want the business to thrive. We want to make a profit. If we're doing that, 
enjoy your life. And I think if you're really good at your job, you can set up parameters to do that. And that's what I, I feel like I've done. And I feel like I, and how I can get away with unlimited vacation, because I honestly don't care when you take days off, you should care that it's covered and that you're good to go. And that your, uh, that your goals and your KPIs and everything that is being measured is still above bore. Other than that, you should be good. Just like me. I'm, I'm, I can't just take a, a, six months off. I can't do that. My investors would fire me in a heartbeat. So about your old life. No, I couldn't do that. My old life, my old life was in the office, be visible. My old life was be, um, being visible is extremely important, but that, that life was go from meeting to meeting to meeting. Have you ever, have you ever, do you use Microsoft outlook? Mm -hmm. Um, do you use the calendar? There's a feature in there that will actually uh, calculate your day. You should do it for fun. I used to do it. Yeah. 120% of my day was, was dominated every day by meetings. (laughs) And they were mostly useless, right? Yeah. How many could have been emailed? So I used to just come in early (laughs) and stay late just so that I could actually do the job I was hired for, but I would spend so much time in meetings. So. It was a different world. I think um, you are, you're probably s- telling something that's unsaid. So for you Bobs out there that are paying attention, the more of your day, and I'm generalizing here, but I'm going to go for it anyway. Fuck it. The more of your day that is dedicated to meetings, the higher you are in your organization. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. I, w- I would call that a general rule. So if yeah. you show up for an eight hour day and six of those hours is meetings, you're you director above. Quite a thing. <laughs> Yeah. That's why executives have assistants. That's why executives defer a lot. Um, one of Leon's favorite words is delegation. I agree with him. But you, you run into that scenario of, and we kind of gets back to AI, which is one of our earlier topics, is you're going to have to have somebody do that kind of grudge work, that grunt, just fucking move these cells around in a spreadsheet. I don't have time. I got to go to a fucking meeting. But it all gets back to this meeting could have been an email. But again, you got to take time to run the email. So the whole, the whole idea of unlimited PTO, unlimited PTO, one, trusts you to be a grown-up, which is very difficult. Yeah. But it also Higher says, well. I don't want to be responsible for calculating what you're owed. And I think if you are a reasonably responsible adult, you should be able to have a relationship with your boss that says, I need this time. Now, with that being said, there's probably a lot of shitty bosses out there. So my advice to you Bobs out there that are listening is if you have a shitty relationship with your boss, it doesn't matter what you're being paid. It doesn't matter how wonderful the job is. It doesn't matter what the industry is or the company is or anything else. If you have a shitty relationship with your boss, leave. Do not stay. Because if you look at the statistics and you look at the science, the number one reason people leave companies is not for pay. It's not for the industry. It's not for the work. It's because of their boss. Mm Mm-hmm. So if we're going to go to an era of where PTO is no longer existent and you can now do what you need to do for work-life balance, make sure you have a good relationship with your boss. Yeah, that's good. Leon's employees, get it together. Oh, I have the best employees. You do have have good employees. All right. Did we beat this horse? Horse is dead. Good man. Number 11. An overwhelming majority of Americans, 79%, express a negative sentiment when asked to describe politics in the United States. Yep. And I know this is one of your favorites, Leon. Among those Mm -hmm. who volunteered an answer, 8% use the word divisive or variations. Mm -hmm. 2% cite polarized. Corrupt is the second most frequent answer. Top 15 most cited words also include messy, chaos, broken, dysfunctional. Many respondents are even more negative in their views. Terrible, disgusting, disgrace. And the phrase dumpster fire are each offered by at least 1% <laughs> of respondents. And we have ourselves a scatter plot with bubbles. Now, you as a data guy have to love the bubble plot. This is wonderful. Yeah, I love them. They're, they're used a lot for uh, surveys just to kind of... To give you scale and yeah. correlation. Yeah. So we have, so for those of you Bob's listening at home, when you go to the article, you're going to see divisive, corrupt, bad, messy, and polarized. Mm-hmm. Top six. I mean, 
I, I could talk to a blue in the face, but you know that our political system, if we continue to tee up two jackholes to lead our country, oh, 100%. when you go out and actually poll people and go, is this the smartest, best person you, you possibly could elect in this position? If you get more than 5% to say yes to the two candidates we have, I'd be shocked because it isn't. It's very rare that we have the smartest, the most ethical, the most articulate, the best of us is what who's supposed to be at the top. We don't get that. So our system is broken in the way that it promotes whoever for us to elect. We know that we're de- we're dealing with it. And in a way to mask that mess, they pit us against each other on certain hot button topics and make us hate each other. When the truth is we don't really hate each other at all. And most people that I, I know my best friends are split down the line, both sides. And uh, my family split, split down the line, both sides. But I have noticed in the last 10 years, it's, it's gotten more like this, chart says more divisive more aggressive with topics passionate people get super angry about it Um, i don't know if it's because uh of the way that the information's being disseminated to us now Uh, that's that's usually the way it is um but either way it's if you really get people in a room and ask them honest questions do you like this or this do you like this or this do you like this or this i bet we'd be a lot fucking closer than the country shows that we're divided. And that's where I I struggle with our political system. So for the Bobs out there, what I want you to do is I want you to go to your favorite search engine, Google, Bing, DuckDuckGo, Brave, whatever. And I want you to type in a search string that will yield a result of how much do the left and right get along? And what you'll find is a Venn diagram of about 80%. That 20% difference has become so violent and so, I I don't think toxic's fair. I want to say poisonous. I want to say venomous. I want to say something that yields some real spice, right? But that 20%, and maybe noisy, I think that's fair. But that that final 20% of their difference is where you get into statements like Charlie Kirk saying, I'm a one issue voter. Well, you're an asshole. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You really want to look at as many facets as you can because I, I agree with Leon 110%. It's always the evil of two lessers. You're always going to get two candidates who are like, oh, fuck these fucking people. Like right now, we're arguing over people who are over 75. The really? two front runner candidates are over 75. The average age of the United States, and I mean the mean, I mean, take all, everybody in the United States and add their ages up and divide. Is 39. Do you think, Bobs, do you think that a 75 year old person, now granted, Donald is 78 and Biden is what, 79? They're really going on 105. Yeah, going on 115. Do you think a 75 year old has any concept of what a 39 year old goes through, given what's going on now in terms of finance, technology, economic activity, all of that stuff? So to suggest that somebody that old would have the pulse of the nation is insulting. That's why I think Bill Burr said it best oh, when he said, boy. I just want to elect somebody who's going to be along, 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 alive long enough to reap what they sow. Oh, <laughs> and Billy it's Redface. true. They're making decisions that they're not even going to be alive for. Yeah, they're going to be dead. We, we used to deal with that a lot when we were in college. We would make these votes on issues that would pass six years later. And it was a very clever thing to do for college kids. Sure. So you're going to vote on this and we won't feel it for six years. And anybody that yeah. was paying attention at all would go, in six years, I'm not going to be here. You mm-hmm. asshole. But that's kind of how they do it. So a lot of the American yeah. voting systems like that. Yeah. Now, second point that I'm going to make on this, and then I want to leave it alone because I want to give Liam a point. Okay. Divisiveness ended with the radio. If you go back and you do a study of American politics, 
individual echo chambers based on, you said it, Leon, information delivery. If you go back and you look at individual echo chambers of information, it was based on your local newspaper, where you had a telegraph office, where the Pony Express could get to. And you had individual newspapers, even as far back as Ben Franklin's Philadelphia. You had individual newspapers that had a very distinct partisan tack. We're talking about the Tories and the Whigs here. Going as far back as that, the only time in recorded history that you had any kind of centrist, mass populous center was with the invention of the radio. Because the radio had the scale to reach everybody. So when I look at the idea of in history, and I'm using air quotes here like uh, Chris Farley, in history, when you look at how divisive things are in politics, I think this is not precedent. It's annoying. It's certainly not productive. This session of Congress is probably one of the weakest in years. Mm -hmm. But as far as historical precedent, I don't think this is anything new. That's not to say that I don't like it. I want to fire all of them. But I don't think this is anything novel. I yield the floor to you, sir. I think the missing giant bubble here is trust. And I think we've lost it. And I think uh, when we start to see on both sides career politicians, and we've talked about Mm -hmm. term limits on senators, that go in with $1 million and the only thing they do for their whole life is be a senator or a member of the house and they retire at 250 or 300 million. Like, I don't know you how you don't Nancy. I'm just saying, how do you not shake your head at that? I mean, it's, it's blatant. It's blatant in our face and they're benefiting and it's, you know, they'll, they'll pit us against each other. Rich, poor, rich, poor. Like you're supposed to be on our side. We hired you. To speak for us, and you came yeah. out of there, We're paying you to two thousand percent richer. So you weren't on our side, and that's something that has to be addressed. I think that our forefathers nailed it when they put things like term limits in 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 play when it applied, um, but they didn't go far enough to realize how corrupt people could be. Uh, there is there is no government in the world, by the way, that doesn't is that isn't completely infected with corruption. Hundred percent. There isn't. There's there isn't. It's people who want power are almost always corrupt. So, uh, and they will do whatever they can to get power. Like I personally, I'm a really good person. I think I don't want power. I happen to have a little tiny bit in a very small sphere. And that's all I ever want or ever need. Um, and yeah, I don't abuse it in my you. opinion. No, I'm, I'm not elected, but I also feel like I can see how powerful can, uh, I can inflict a lot of hardship on my team very easily, but I also know the repercussions of doing that. And and there are constant decisions where I have to go, to tap into my soul and say, what's the right thing to do here? It's not the right, not the right financial thing for my own pocketbook, but what is right? What is the and, right thing? Yep. and that is the type of person you need in office. And we're not getting it. We never will. There's no system in place or ever will be that will elect the best of all of us. So we're stuck with what we have. We have to have our heads on a swivel. If you've only, only voted Democrat or only voted Republican or only voted independent, you're doing it wrong. That's right. You're doing it wrong. You're not paying attention. So you need to, you need to understand the candidate themselves. You need to jump in. And promote what you can. And I will tell you, although it's not as highly publicized, it's far more important in a lot of cases. Pay attention to your local elections. Mm, Pay attention thank you, to Leo. your local boards, your school boards, your um, your local mayors. Pay attention. 
they have a lot more power than is publicized and they have a lot more influence than you think they do. Um, your, your representative, pay attention to that. Pay attention to what they want to do. A lot of people don't vote for these elections. They go for the big ones because those are the ones that are the most, they have billions and billions of dollars behind them. People yeah, they're publicized, they're large. You know, how many, how many of the Bobs out there just skipped an election? Because, yeah, I don't know anything about this one. Do you know who your state senator representative is? Do you know who your city council is? I'd say 90% of people don't. Do you know who your tax assessor is? And I don't just mean the label on the gas pump at the gas station. Do you know who these people are? Because they're the ones making the decisions that really affect them. That's right. And I'm going to build on what Leon was saying is these people in five or 10 years are going to rise to the ranks of senator. And so if you think these people just all of a sudden one day go, I'm going to run for Senate. No. So out here in my land, we have my representative, Debbie Lesko. Mm -hmm. I think Debbie is a waste of space. And if I had the means, I would slap her in the face if I saw her. I'm not going to do that because she's a mother. She's a grandmother. She's actually probably a very nice human. Professionally, she's a piece of shit. And I have the mm -hmm. ability to separate those things. I can say you're a good person and an awful politician. Debbie worked her way up through the county commission. She made it to the state senate. She busted around the state senate for a while. And she eventually made it to the United States Congress. She's doing some pretty good things. There's a lot of things that she's doing I don't like. First and foremost is her weekly newsletter of own the Dems. We Republicans rule the world. I'm like, sweetheart, you're responsible for a piece of geography in the state of Arizona. I don't give a fuck what your political affiliation is. What are you doing for my geography? And she is right. failing. For those of you Bobs out there that need a reminder, an elected representative is responsible for going out there and voting in your interest. What I want is her fighting for Northwest Phoenix. I don't want Southwest Phoenix getting more than me. That's your job, Debbie. I'm very happy that Debbie is retiring. Anybody interested in your local representative? That's their job. It's not party. It's not ideology. It's geography. Their job is to show up and vote for you and your interest in that place. So when you run into these bubbles here, divisive, messy, corrupt, polarized, confusing, chaos, deceit, dysfunctional, it's because they forgot their job. Their job is to represent a corner of the world and whatever that corner wants. Now, if you don't like your neighbors, well, maybe you should move. Mm -hmm. That's probably another topic for another day. Leon, is this horse dead? This horse is dead. Let's move on. On we move! <laughs> Number 12. Around half of Americans say they have ever been visited by a dead family member in a dream. This, is a, this is a departure from our regular fare. I'm rather fascinated by this. Six in ten members of the historically black Protestant tradition say they've been visited by a dead relative in a dream. Hmm. So what are we talking about here? Are we talking about like Patrick Swayze showing up with Whoopi Goldberg and making pots with Demi Moore? Like what, what, That's what are we talking assumption. about? Here? Yeah. So fun fact, 46% of Americans report that they've been visited by a dead family member in a dream while 31% report having been visited by dead relatives in some other form, women are more likely than men to report these experiences. Before Correct. you go there, before you go there. <laughs> For example, the survey did not ask what respondents <laughs> meant when they said they had been visited in a dream. Some might have meant that relatives were trying to send them messages or information from beyond. Others might have had something more commonplace in mind, such as dreaming about a favorite memory of a family member. Now, if we had fucking hours, I would talk about dreams. This is one mm -hmm. of Danny's. I, I am gay for dreams. I, I am so fascinated by this. Inception has to be my favorite movie. Mm. If we have time, we should get into that. Okay. In this context... What do you think is happening here, Leon? Because they seem, and again, we're talking about Pew, who you're a little skeptical about. Hey, I don't know enough about him. They seem to be breaking it down by religious affiliation. What do you think? Hmm. I don't know. I, I think that you're spiritual or you're not, and Ooh. you believe in it or not. And I think that it doesn't really matter. I, but I do think 
it's a very strong difference between men and women because bitches be crazy. So. <laughs> Says the man with an empty house. That's right. I can get away with that statement. And still say sleep louder, on my say bed. Say louder for the bobs at home. Bitches be crazy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's a note here. High religious commitment includes those who do each of the following three things. Attend religious services at least weekly. Say religion is very important in their life. And pray daily. That's high religious commitment. Low. I tell you a story about my, my dad. Yeah, pause. Sorry, go ahead. Go for it. No, you finish your point. That's not fair. You had a good point, Co. Low religious commitment includes those who do each of the following three things. Attend religious services seldom or never. Say religion is not too or not at all important in their life or seldom or never pray. The medium religious commitment categories include everyone else. So there's three religious categories. Mm -hmm. Uh... I have to say to myself, uh, I want to. I want to say I'm low religious commitment, yeah, but I'm very curious you. what medium is now. Mm -hmm. I would put myself in the medium high category. Yeah. Okay. But do you uh, go to service? I, I do not. That's why I go okay. to medium. Yeah. Okay, but you pray. Yeah, I pray. Okay, so you I, pray. I, you pray, and religion is important. Yeah. Very well. I believe. I believe in God, and I. I believe that. So I would. I will say. The, the, this this is a pretty funny story, <laughs> but it, on, along these lines, my great grandmother, she passed away about ninety four years old, sharp as a tack. I mean, and sharp as a tack. I didn't know but, her, right? Uh, maybe you, you, Grandma Bear, maybe had to be my grandma's brief when we were kids, right? Uh, at least five or six years while we were kids, you would she was alive. Yeah. As um, but even in her last days, sharp as a tack. And uh, my grandmother was the same way, sharp as a tack, like didn't lose a beat in, in their 90s. I hope I get there too. My dad on her deathbed, you know, he was, he'd visit her every day and they would talk and they would play cards or whatever. And she would, she knew she was on her way out and they would have very, and my grandmother would get so upset. How could you talk to her about that? How could you talk? My dad's like, this is what she wants to talk about. So I'm going to talk about, and he would say, Okay, here's the deal. I don't believe in the afterlife. So if you come visit me after you die, like make a point of it. Like somehow I, I somehow let's 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 come up with a thing right now. When you die, because it's gonna happen any day now, you come see me somehow. I don't know if you're gonna turn on lights or clap in my ear or something, um, but do it in the next week. And then I'll know there's an afterlife. And she said, yeah, I'll do that. Like they made a pact, like this is going to happen. And so after she passed away, That's my insane. dad was like on edge for a week. Like, <laughs> is she coming? Is, is this going to happen? And nothing happened. So now my dad doesn't believe in the afterlife. Oh, yeah. I'm not. And I know uh, that my grandmother, my great grandmother would have fucking made that happen because she was, she was that kind of woman. She's like, hold on, God, I got a thing to do. I'll be right back. But didn't work out. So I, I had one of those weird moments. I'm not, I don't consider myself a religious person. There's nothing wrong with it. I think you do you. Um, yeah. You want to talk about the evils of the Catholic Church. I have all the time in the world. But religion as a sure. thing, don't care. I take my kids to a church for, for soccer. I mean, my, my wife likes to go to services occasionally on Saturday. And I think it's, this is one of those the term secular church is not entirely correct, but they got a band and everybody has a great time and it's more like a show. It's you go there and, and there's a little bit of scripture, but it's more about community. I love that. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. If you recall, Leon, the mountain that I got married on, on the cliff with the gazebo mm -hmm. and the grass and the gigantic fall off that went down like a thousand feet and then the sweeping vista of Pennsylvania pine trees in the distance. Do you remember all that? Mm-hmm. The vague memories of that? I wrote a song about it. Do you recall to the side of the groom's wedding party a very large chunk of granite? Nope. Almost, almost boulder-sized. I do not. Okay. So you were like, like I, for whatever reason, I had all my groomsmen in the AT&T signal bars, so you were 
fairly in the middle. My height, yeah. Uh, you may not have noticed it, but towards the end, off the end of Ziggy, was this gigantic white chunk of boulder that was right next to the end of the first row of, of uh, foldable chairs. You with me so far? Okay. Okay. After all was said and done, ceremony of the rings, the the thou, though, promise, doeth, all that shit, the candle and whatever else we did. We took pictures, we came back. You guys were off at the bar. I'm proud of you. We came back and we kind of congregated as a family for pictures. You know how that works. Mm -hmm. After the pictures were all done and the photographer was walking away, my family, wife's family, had kind of gone back to the party. We decided to stick around and hang out by those chairs, marvel at the scenery. Oh, my God, so much green. This doesn't exist. What is this sorcery? At the moment where we're all kind of sitting there on the folding chairs, kind of marveling at the little gazebo where we got married, over on that little granite rock, this little red robin came and landed and mm -hmm. sat there and kind of, we like to think, made eye contact with all of us and then took off. And the little squat chicken hawk wedding coordinator, Linda, I don't know if you ever met her, she mm -hmm. came walking up at the moment going, I love you guys. I really don't want to rush you out of here, but guess what? We have to flip the space. So spend some time, have emotions, be you. We got to go. She came over and she went, ooh, we haven't seen one of those in a long time. Mm -hmm. And so what we think is that little red bird was my mother's mother. Okay. Because she loved robins. It was one of her things. So for a little robin to show up unbeknownst, unannounced, rare. We determined that that was a blessing of the nuptials. Mm -hmm. So even from a religious context, I can kind of see how this goes down. Six and 10 members of a Protestant tradition say they've been visited by a dead relative. I, I'm okay with that. That tracks. How does that play with you? There's a lot of things that happen that are unexplainable. Okay. And there's, we are so influential. If you think you're not influential, you're a moron. <laughs> How you woke up this morning, the first commercial you watched, the first song you listened to, what your daughter or son said to you this morning, what your wife said to you last night affects how your day is going to go and then what you're going to do. And when things happen that are arguably unexplainable, that's where spiritualism chimes in and it, it provides an answer. And if, if you don't buy into it, that's fine. If you don't believe in coincidences, that's fine too. But there's nothing wrong with people that do. And there's nothing wrong that with people that believe in uh, that the coincidences or the events that happen are for uh, are maybe a little bit more planned or aligned than just complete chaos and random. And that's okay too. So I think what, if anything's happened in the last, especially 20 years, but definitely 10 years, it's listen, a lot of shit happens and a lot of people believe what they're going to believe. And I think we all just kind of have to get on board with understanding that these these people from India and these people from New York and these people from Texas and these people from Canada and these people from Southern California and these people from Phoenix and these people from San Francisco have very different lives with very different interactions with very different things. And if you think we are all living the same life, you're out of your fucking mind. So let's try our best to understand that what everybody's going through and just take a step back and let them live their life for whatever that's worth. Well said. I like it. I think that's, that's the right way to go. Well done, man. It's the booze. It's not me. That wraps up our first two parter here in the bottle of Brown podcast. Tune in for part two of episode 99 when Leon and I take on more pew and go deep in the paint, discussing the topics Americans care about. See you next time. Same Brown time. Same Brown channel, bottleofbrown.com.
place is dead anyway, man. <laughs>